couldn't resist uh, starting this morning with a funny story that I heard about Father's Day. And uh, it was written uh, by uh, someone on the internet. It says, my uh, five-year-old son and I were headed to McDonald's one day. We passed a car accident. And usually when we see something terrible like that, we say a prayer for those who might be hurt. So I pointed and I said, we should pray. And from the back seat, I heard his earnest request. Please, God, don't let those cars block the entrance to McDonald's. <laughs> it's a human thing to pray. People have been doing it since the beginning of human history, since the beginning of time. I uh, wanted to mention today the Transcendentalist Movement. Some of you have
further than that. And I want to say to you today that religion was born in a cave. And there's something wrong when we say that there were cave men. Not only since it wasn't just cave men, but it was also cave women. That's the first thing that's wrong when we say cave men. But they probably didn't live in caves. They discovered paintings on the walls of caves. And they discovered ritual fires in caves. They probably didn't live in caves. It's kind of one of the first mistaken notions when we started modern anthropology about the same time as the transcendentalists did. They worshipped in caves. Anytime they had a question in their life, anytime they were passing into adulthood, they went to a cave to have a ritual. As a matter of fact, many of our Native Americans were doing that when our uh, European ancestors came to this country. A cave was a sacred sanctuary and a place, a ritual, where you asked God questions and you found answers. So, could this story, I always, I always have this really uh, uh, strong sense to go back and I hear a story like this, 1 Kings 19, and to our modern sensibilities, it makes no sense, right? To our modern sensibilities, the average person on the street, they are not going to name that. And I always wonder, what were these ancient Israelite prophets really doing? What was Elijah doing when he ran away into the desert? What was he doing when he ran up and hid in the city? Could 1 Kings 19 be a remnant of some of these ancient prayer rituals that were alive and well in that part of the world, even in that time, which we're probably talking about? 2,500 years ago. Since the beginning of time, people have needed to have a quiet place to find their calling, to find their mission, and to find their connection to the ultimate power of the universe. And many of these stories can remind us of a part of our nature that in our own time is often neglected and forgotten because we are so busy. We are so caught up in the world as it is that we don't think about these questions that are so central to us being human beings. Why am I here? What is my mission? What is the purpose? How do I find joy in life? So we gather in Sunday mornings. We created our own faith created our own sacred space. We've created a way for us to change our everyday consciousness and come here to think differently than we're taught to think in the world. We're here to search our hearts and become new people. We're here to ask those important questions about what is my calling and how can I be connected to God? It wasn't just Elijah that went to caves. Moses before him. Hey, you may be confusing this story. Like if you, you know, you hear a biblical story and you think, that's not the way I remember that story. It might be because there's almost an exact story of Moses going up in a cave to meet God. Remember that story where God puts his hand over the, the uh, cave entrance and says, you can't see, no man can see me face to face. But you'll see me as I pass by and God, as God walks by and moves a hand and Moses sees God passing by in the distance. So you might remember that, but it's the same story. It's the same theme. We create sacred space with candles. Probably one of the, for me, uh, one of the times of the year when I really can feel the presence of God is uh, Christmas Eve services. And why is that? Because we darken everything and we have candles and we have a sense that it's a special day and something new will happen the next day. And somehow, we have to find a way to experience the sacred in our everyday lives, or else we'll be caught up in the rush, caught up in our everyday lives. And there are so many people today uh, who are just trudging through life without really grabbing a hold of it, and without living mindfully, and realizing that this is the day that you're placed on the edge of the promised land. 
That's what it means when we're baptized. We go through the River Jordan. We're being placed on the banks of the River Jordan, and the promised land is laying before us. And the question is, are we going to grab a hold of it? Or are we going to keep trudging? A very important quote that we have is from Henry David Thoreau, who also was influenced by the Transcendentals. And he said, most men live lives of quiet desperation. Most of us know that part, but there's a second part to it. And they go to their grave with their song still in them. Whenever I have a wedding, I had a wedding yesterday. I, I got actually six Saturdays in a row when I have a wedding, and I'm not sure why, but uh, June, I guess, but most people don't get married in June anymore. But it's happening. And I always say, look, you know, we're setting you on the edge of the promised land. So grab a hold of this new life. Do the kinds of things that make for a joyful life to do. Learn uh, the spiritual technique of loving another person. So maybe in our passage today, Thoreau had a very good description of the prophet Elijah. He was in quiet desperation. He was living a life of quiet desperation because he didn't feel that he could meet the demands of his life. He was running away from that. So one of the most important <laughs> questions that we could ever ask is, how can I get my spirit back? How can you renew the enthusiasm and the innocence of your youth. Now, a counseling technique is, uh, we're told not to ask, what do you think? But it's more productive to get at the heart of an issue of someone's distress by asking them, what happened to you? What happened to you that caused you to lose your enthusiasm? What happened to you that caused you to lose your longing for God and your connection to something larger than yourself? So many people today, they're done. They're done. They just want to numb themselves. It says that our hymn, they want to numb. Are you done? Have you had enough? Are you ready to give up? Those are all the kind of questions people are asking. And it's about discouragement. You'll notice in our passage today that, that the Lord says to Elijah, you need to take and eat to carry yourself or else the journey will be too much for you. And that's God's observation of our lives. If we don't take care of ourselves, life will be too much for us. If we don't find these ways to connect to something larger, then life is going to be too much for us. And we have to learn to lean on that presence and to find that place of still calm. And at one time or another, everyone feels like they're all alone. And Elijah is this uh, larger-than-life character who's been lifted up in the Old Testament. And even Elijah with all of his knowledge and wisdom, with all of his political savvy, even he gave up and ran away. But he found her new Listen for the still small voice. And you notice again and again, you have a piece of scripture before you. Um, again and again, God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? How do we connect with God? That's a great existential question, right? It might be a great question you come to worship for in this cave. It's a question that God certainly asks us every time we come to worship. What are you doing here? It's a divine question. It's a question about mindfulness. What are you doing here? question and I ask uh, people uh, when they get married, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And maybe all preaching boils down to that one question. 
What am I doing here? What am I doing with my life? Think about it. What are you doing here? Why do you come to work? What longing is it that is satisfied? What did you expect to hear this morning? Did you expect to connect with God? To find that source of renewal and refreshment that we find throughout Scripture? We all long for God even if we admit it or not. And we know that there's something more to life than pain to life. Did you know that commercials used to be louder than they are now? Did you know that? Did you ever notice that? You watch a show and all of a sudden, bang, there's a commercial that comes out. It's a lot louder. Do you know it took an act of Congress to prevent commercials from being uh, a certain amount louder? The Calm Act. I like that. C-A-L-M. The Calm Act. I don't know what it stands for. Maybe the church could have a Calm Act. It was legislated in 2010 and went into effect in 2012 that commercials can't be so much louder than the program that's on. Do you know that? How many of you knew that there was? Actually, had to pass a law in Congress so that people couldn't blare commercial ads. That ought to tell us kind of what good it is. It's where we're literally inundated by sound, by messages. Uh, take a look at the statistics about how many commercials we'll see over the course of the day, of course your life. We're just bombarded by the world telling us what we need, telling us what we want. And God is not in the flesh. God's in the everyday. So we have to have some kind of mindfulness training to pay attention to what we hear and to filter what we hear. And so let's put it this way. What if it is that we fear the silence because the silence is hearing the question that God asked Elijah? What are you doing here? What are we doing here? So a while ago, I used to do a one-minute conclusion, and Ben Gunn used to time me on it. So you ready? <laughs> All right. Okay, here we go. Your assignment this week is to ask yourself, what am I doing here? A few weeks ago, I preached a sermon. Uh, it was on Paul's. And it's whatever condition I am in, I'm learning to be content. And I said, okay, this week, go out. And anytime you need it, just say to yourself, I am content. And believe me, there were a whole bunch of people that week ahead that said, yeah, this week I'm just saying I am content. So ask yourself, well, what can I do here? What is God calling me to do right here? And our world asks all the wrong questions. What do I want? What do I need? Where am I going? But faith asks, what does God want? What is God saying? Where is God going? So don't settle for a life of quiet desperation. Don't go to the grave with your song still inside of you. Elijah renewed his spirit and changed the world. And your longing for God must be the quest of your life. Amen. That may follow. All right. <laughs>